Today we're going to continue. We've been talking on the mind game. And so the devil's always wanting to play with our mind. Uh, we've learned that, what does the Bible say? It says we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness. And it says what? That we should bring every thought into captivity. So really, where is the spiritual warfare in our life? It's, it's in our mind. It's between our two ears. And as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. So what is the stronghold? Is we keep thinking something over and over, or we have an experience where we... Uh, causes us to think or experience a certain way, it reinforces that way of thinking. And so as we come to Christ, God wants to renew our mind. We looked at Romans 12 and verse 2, and the Bible says that how, well, how are we transformed? It says, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but what? Be transformed. Someone say, be transformed. Yeah. How are we transformed? By the renewing of your mind. Well, I'm going to be transformed. I'm going to pray. Well, that's part of it. You got to come in the presence of, of God so you can hear God, but, but you've got to be in the word. You've got to renew your mind. It, it's renewed through the word. And it says, then you'll be able to, to test and approve what's God's will, the good, the pleasing, and the perfect will of God. If we don't have an understanding of how God thinks, we don't have an understanding of God's ways, then we're going to be out of position from how God wants us to be and how he wants to bless us. Are you here? Amen. And so the Greek word for the word mind, we've learned is the word phronema. Someone say phronema. phronema. It's how our thinking is structured. It's not just a thought, but how is our thinking structured? What's our mindset? What's our mental inclination? It actually literally means not what you think, but how you think, why you think a certain way. And how many of you through this series, you begin, you begin to realize some wrong thoughts, processes, some wrong ways of thinking? And so we got to understand why we've been thinking that way, and we've got to begin to renew our mind and choose to think differently. And really, what does it all come back to? It all comes back to having a revelation of sonship. Do we operate through the sonship, being a daughter of God mindset, or are we servants, or are we orphans? And so we looked at those mindsets, and many times we could be in the house of God, just like the prodigal son's brother, but our mindsets are off. If you missed out on that, go back. Uh, the messages are on uh, YouTube, all the different platforms. Come on, don't have holes in your Christianity. Some people want to show up every six weeks. No wonder they have problems in their faith. Wow. <laughs> Come on, God's building line upon line, precept upon precept. If you went to university and did that, you probably wouldn't do very well. Amen. I wouldn't want you be, being my engineer. Amen. <laughs> so so if you, I know you can't be there, but anyway, follow along with what's happening. Don't just be in a religious habit. I show up and come and just praise the Lord and then live my life. And then no wonder I'm not knowing the good, the perfect, and, and, and uh, the will of God. Are you here? Amen. So I put this up. Sonship qualifies us for an inheritance. Do you want the inheritance that God has for you? We've got to have the mindset of a son then. And Paul prayed this in Ephesians 1 and verse 8. He said, I pray that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, that you would know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance to the saints. God has an inheritance for you. Come on, tell your neighbor. He's got an inheritance for you. But we've got to have a revelation of that inheritance or we're not going to be able to receive it. Or we're out there thinking, I got to earn it. I got to do something more. No, come on, when you're a son, it qualifies us as a daughter for the inheritance. Two weeks ago, we learned the three basic truths concerning money. Because if we don't have the mindset of a son, we're going to always struggle with money. Yeah. We're going to always struggle because we really don't trust God. And what did we learn? We learned three weeks ago that there's three things that we need to understand. That number one, being pure and holy doesn't mean you must be poor. That's the greatest lie that's been in the church. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's better not to have anything. Just, you know, come to God and just give your life to God and don't worry about being successful. How selfish is that? Where we come to God and, and what? We're not able to help anybody else. Yeah. Number two, we looked at God has no problem with wealth and abundance. Come on, God is wealthy. Yeah. God is a God of abundance. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Yeah. Heaven is not built with bronze. The streets of heaven are gold. The angels have gold belts. God created in the, the garden all the wealth, and he said it is good. Amen. Don't call what God says good bad. Right. And don't call what God says bad good. Amen? And thirdly, we did learn that God desires, des, excuse me, delights in seeing his children prosper. Point to someone behind you and say, he's talking about you. Come on. God delights in seeing us prosper. What parent doesn't want their kid to prosper? Yeah. Come on, how many of you are a parent here? Yeah. We want your kids to prosper to be better than us. Yeah. 
Amen? That's the heart of, of a parent. And so if God can bring money through us, he, he'll bring money to us. Amen? Amen? And so what does it really boil down to? Are we a steward of our Father's house? Are we a steward of all the things that he's entrusted to us? When we begin to see life like that, that we're, we're, we're uh, you know, a steward of everything and an owner of nothing. That's what it means to be a Christian. I'm a steward of everything. Everything I have, all my car, my assets, my ministry, you know, everything in this building, all these things, it doesn't belong to us. We're just stewards of it. It belongs to God. And when we have that mindset, guess what? It takes the pressure off things. Because ultimately, God is the one who is in control. Are you here? Yeah. We've got to be a steward of everything and an owner of nothing. Amen? Yeah. But what is required of stewards? We ended off, we learned that stewardship is what? Our ability to manage the things God's entrusted to us. But what's required of stewards? That we would be faithful. Yeah. First Corinthians 4 verse 2 says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that you be found faithful. Someone say Required. And if you're not faithful with the little, you're not going to be faithful over much. If you're not faithful with what you got, well, I'm believing God's going to prosper you. Well, what are you doing with what he's giving you now? You ain't even giving him 10%, some people. Only 20% of the church gets 10%. I'm not talking about our church. I'm talking about across the board. And then we, we wonder why we are not being prospering and we think that we're being faithful. Are you here? And then, well, I'm giving my 10%. Well, what about the 90%? Are you here? Because the 10%, it says, belongs to God. What are we doing with the 90%? We've got to be stewards. We've got to be faithful with a little or not be faithful over much. You say, well, I don't have enough, Pastor. For you to say you, you don't have enough is to say God isn't a good God. For you to say you don't have enough is to say your, your Father is not providing for you. We got real quiet here. We're going to take it further. Are you ready? Yes. Stewardship. I put up for you, is seen in how we manage what God has given to us. Yeah. It has to do with our time. It has to do with our talent. It has to do with our treasure. Yeah. So stewardship of our life belongs to God. How many believe that you, Jesus is your Lord? What does that mean? You've given him your life. But how do you honor God with your time? How do you honor God with, with your talent and the gifts and the abilities he's given you? How do you honor God with your treasure, which is what? how you get rewarded really for your time and for your talent. Yeah. That shows our stewardship. And the Bible teaches us that giving is the number one thing God looks at to see our response to his provision and to what he's given to us. What is giving? It's a response to what God has done for us in the past. Yeah. How many believe God's been faithful? As we give, what are we doing? We're, we're acknowledging God was faithful in the past. But guess what? It's not just about the past. It's about the present. Do we trust God to be faithful in the present? Yeah. 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 And not only that, do we trust that there's a harvest coming in the future? Yeah. It all comes back to trust. And some of us, well, we maybe haven't had a past uh, where we've trusted God. That's why God says the only time in the Bible, tests me in this. It's the only time God says you can test him. Test me in this. If you do not bring your tithes and offerings in, if I'll not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing you don't have room to contain. What is God saying? Test me. Put me to the test. But if you don't ever put him to the test and trust God, how are you ever going to be able to trust God and have a past? Some of our past isn't good because we haven't been trusting God. And if our past isn't good, guess what? We're going to struggle trusting God in the present. And we're sure not trusting God with the future. Are you see? So how we trust God, it will determine what our future is going to look like. And our future eventually becomes our past. We're living in the present and what? We're prospering and we're, we're trusting God for the future. Yeah. But it starts with us honoring God. Not because we feel guilty. Not because we feel we have to. But because we're a son and a daughter and we trust our father. Amen. Are you here? 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 7 says this, just as you excel in everything else, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. God wants us to grow in giving. As much as you grow in faith and love and knowledge, he wants us to grow in giving too. Now let me ask you, are you growing in your giving? 
Well, I've been giving 10% for the last 10 years. Well, it's time to grow. (laughs) Come on. You know, I look at the point now, I don't even look, but when I get my statement at the end of the year, I'm shocked at how much I gave. I'm like, wow, how did I do that? But God provides, because I'm a steward. Are you here? We've got to come to the place where we're not just struggling with 10%. We're not just struggling with a 12%. But we're, 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 we're coming to the place of supernatural abundance. Are we growing in faith? I pray you are. Are you growing in, in, in your love? I hope you are. But let's also grow in the grace of giving. Amen. Why? Giving more than anything else shows that you trust God. Are we operating out of that orphan mindset that we're trying to make things work and we're keeping it and doing it in our own strength? No wonder we fail. No wonder we struggle. No wonder we're stressed out. Are you here? Or are we operating as sons and daughters knowing what? The Father's going to take care of us. Do we believe God is a good God that he's going to take care of us? then why can't we trust him? Why, why aren't we having to hold on to the security of the world rather than trusting in the security of God? One of the most incredible verses and all-encompassing verses is found in Philippians 4, verse 19. Let's read it together. I put it up for you. One, two, three, ready, starting now. God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. What does the Bible say? If you're putting God first... God will meet all your needs. Not God might. God what? Will. What does that mean? There's an absolute there. God's saying he's stating his reputation on it. God's saying, I will meet all your needs. It's a promise. Are you here? Who's going to meet? God's going to meet. It's not your boss. It's not President Biden. It's definitely not your congressman and your senator. Come on. It's it's God who is the source of all things. God says that he's going to meet it all. Does does that include our car payment? Does that include your mortgage? Does that include your rent? Does that include if you need braces? God will supply all your needs. If you have a Bible, circle the world need, under, underline it. Notice here it says God will meet all your needs, not your greeds. Sometimes we spend what we have on our greeds and we don't have enough for our needs and we get upset with God. Oh, it got real quiet here. We, God says he'll supply all your needs. As a parent, again, we want our kids to have everything that, that they need, right? But do we give them everything they want? Erica, no. <laughs> Are you here? We don't give them everything they want. Why? We love them. Amen? And we give everything we want. What are they going to do? They're going to be spoiled. They're not going to appreciate things. Or, or they're going to have things that they don't have the maturity to handle. You know? Erica's looking at cars, and I want a car, and getting a car, and we're looking at it. But guess what? She don't even have a license yet. <laughs> she had a friend that her parents bought her a car before she even had a license. I'm like, that's crazy. What the temptations there? Get in the car and drive out, and guess what? You're uninsured and unlicensed. Come on, you don't put keys in an unlicensed child's hand. I meant. Right. And you sure don't give it to Liam. Are you here? Even though he likes to play with cars. But he can't even talk yet. He's just learning to crawl. And so sometimes we think, God, I want everything and I want it now. God's not giving to us. Why? He doesn't want us to be spoiled. (laughs) He doesn't want us not to appreciate it. He doesn't want us to be distracted. He doesn't want us not to be able to manage what he gives to us. So some people, we we don't have what what we say we want. Why? Because we're not, we don't have the maturity there to handle it. Our focus is off. Are you here? And our heavenly father loves us. He's a good father. Do you believe that? So he's going to give us the things that we can handle. He's not going to give the things that would, would, would pollute our heart. 
Are you here? I say this before. Some people, you won the lottery, you would be on a, out traveling the world somewhere and not in church. How is God going to bless with that abundance if we can, money enables us to do the things that are in our heart? We got to get our heart right. So when the finances come, we acknowledge God as the steward and it doesn't destroy our lives. Are you here? God says, I'll meet all your needs. It's according to his wealth. It's according to his riches. It's not based on what you have. It's not based on your assets. Say amen. Amen? Amen. It's based on what God has. And guess what? God doesn't run out of resources. God is not having a financial crisis and trying to figure out where to borrow money to run the world. Are you here? God says, as we're in Christ Jesus, what? I'll supply all your needs. It's not promised for everyone, only if you're in Christ Jesus. People say, well, if God's so good, why doesn't he provide for everyone? Why do things happen? Why is there poverty in the world? Because guess what? They're not in Christ Jesus. He never said he'll promise that he'll supply all the needs of the world. It's only for those that are in Christ Jesus. He didn't say in church. Come on, he said in Christ. There's a lot of people that are in churches this morning all over the world that are not in Christ. Are you here? But he says, if you're my child, if you're a part of my family, I'm going to supply all your needs. Not just your financial needs, but every single need that you have. And you might be sitting here and thinking, well, I don't think that's really happening right now. Did God fail you? Did God lie? Did he exaggerate? Some of you are not sure. (laughs) Of course not. Because we got to understand with every promise, there's a premise. Say with every promise, promise. there's a premise. What does that mean? There's conditions. There's requirements. What is God saying? I'll do my part, but you got to do your part. And if we're not seeing God do his part, the problem is never with God. He's been doing his part for tens of thousands of years. Come on. (laughs) What's the problem? It's we're not doing our part. God laid out financial principles in his word. He gave us financial principles, and we don't have time to look at all of it, but he gave us principles of savings. Are you following them? He gave us principles of spending. He gave us principles of giving. He gave us principles of investing. He gave us principles of how to use our resources and, 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 and help the poor and help people. If we're not following the, the premise, we're not going to see the promise. And all through the Bible, there's conditions. This morning, I want to look at you very quickly, five conditions for us to prosper. And we've got to renew our mind. If we're not following the premise, we're not going to see the promise. But let me tell you, if these premises are met, I can guarantee you, because I got a guarantee, not because Pastor Derek said it, but because God said it. He said, I will supply all your needs according to my, your riches in Christ Jesus. We can bank on that. We can lay our lives down. It doesn't matter what's happening in the economy. It doesn't matter what, what, what people say. We're in a recession or stagflation or inflation or whatever flation or depression, or regression, or whatever titles they come up, or whether they're in denial, whether we're in it or we're not in it, it doesn't matter. Because God said, I, it's not based on this system, I will supply all your needs. Come on. Isaac sowed in a land of famine. It doesn't matter what season it is, and he reaped a hundredfold return. Come on, if Isaac could do it under the old covenant, the Bible says the new covenant is a better covenant, then how much more should he provide for us? Are you here? There's a guarantee. God's promised to meet all our needs, but there's some ifs. If we ask for his help, if we learn to be content, if we practice giving in faith, if we maintain our integrity, our financial integrity, and if we trust him as a son, There's a requirement. And if we don't meet those five requirements, it's not going to happen. Let's look at them. God promised to meet all our financial needs. What? If we ask for his help, number one. What does the Bible say? The Bible tells us in the book of James, chapter 4, verse 2, it says, you do not have because you do not ask. You don't have because you don't ask. Pretty clear. Right? 
God is waiting for us to ask. If we don't ask, the storehouse is shut. Until we open our mouth. If our mouth is shut, the storehouse is shut. God requires we ask. But God knows I have needs. Jesus says you have not because you ask not. The Bible says when we pray, God already knows what we need and what we're going to ask. But we still have to ask. We want God's help. But the problem is we don't ask. You need a car. But did you ask God for it? Did you just go down to the dealership and sign your life away and now you're struggling to pay for that car and complaining to God? Come on. You needed something. You didn't pray. You went to Visa. MasterCard. American Express. Discover. You didn't pray. You didn't ask God. You didn't seek God. You charged. Because I deserve it. I'm a child of God. And now you're grumbling. God, why am I in debt? Because you never asked God. You weren't a steward. You went out and did what you want, and you ask, expect God to pay for it. No, he doesn't work that way. Right. Acknowledge God in all your ways, and he will direct your path. You got no money, but you got a credit card, and I deserve that T-bone steak. <laughs> Come on. I deserve that app. I deserve that. And what do we do? We live that life. That's the story of the American church. Yeah. Most peak Christians are up to uh, their eyeballs in debt. Well, God wants me to prosper. I'm going to go into investment and your investment fail. Did you even pray? Yeah. Did you even seek God? The lowest form of knowledge, I tell people that all the time, is what? Assumption. Yeah. We just assume. And what happens? We get into trouble. Matthew 7, verse 7, Jesus said this, ask and it will be given to you. Search or seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. This is the pattern. Yeah. It starts with God. Yeah. Are you here? Yeah. Now, let's look at this. If you look at the word ask, search, knock, what do the, all the first letters spell? <laughs> ask. <laughs> Don't get, God knows we're a little slow sometimes. <laughs> Next slide, guys. Ask, search, knock. What does it spell? spell? Ask. So if you missed it the first time when he says ask, come on. A-S-K. Ask, seek, knock. It goes back to ask. 20 times in the New Testament God says ask. He wants us to ask. One of the reasons we never see miracles is we're not asking for it. We're asking for a bailout. We're not asking for a business plan. We're making decisions. We're not living as stewards. What does a steward do? They ask. We tell our kids. They have freedoms. But there's certain things you got to ask mom and dad. Come on, you can't just stay out till 2 a.m. But it's Halloween weekend. I don't care what weekend it is. Come on, you're going to come home, the door's locked, and the alarm is on. Are you here? There's a curfew. There's, we don't just ask and then, uh, you know, expect God to do it. Are you here? We got to ask first. There's a law. Before you pay for it, pray for it. Stop and ask God. Come on, say, before I pay for it, I'm going to pray for it. Stop and ask God. And I've had times where, like, I had a need and I didn't have the money. But I prayed for it. I asked for it. And I felt God said, okay. And by the time I needed the money, the money was there. Yeah, but I've had times where I, I'm in faith. Come on. You're not in faith. You're just in presumption. And I ordered something. I went to do it. And when the time to pay it, I didn't have the money. And I said, God, what happened? God did say, I never asked God. I didn't start with God. Honor God. He'll honor you. P pray for it. Ask for it. Then pay for it. What do we do? We pay for it. Then we ask for it. And then we end up paying for it for many months. And people dig a hole. 
We've got to put God first. What is putting God first? Pray for it first. Talk to God first. Some people, you know, got married and didn't even ask God. And now they're praying a lot. (laughs) I'm not even going to go there. Come on. Some pastors, some people, they built these huge empires. Then later they're struggling and they're coming to God and and asking God for a bailout. God said, I never ordered that fountain. I never said you had to have this chandelier. Nothing wrong with, you know, building and, and, and honoring God. But come on, budget is the leading of the Lord. Start with where you're at. I tell people, you know, in real estate, price yourself in the market. I want a five-bedroom house. You can only afford a three right now. Buy a three. Continue to to believe God. And what? Move up from that place. Come on. You know, I want a BMW. I want a Mercedes right now. You can only afford a Mazda. Don't be depressed. Buy a Mazda. Pay it off. Get some equity and buy something else. Are you faithful with what you have? You ain't even faithful with your used car. You didn't change the oil in a year. Come on. You got moldy McDonald's french fries behind your back seat. Come on, I'm not being prophetic this morning, but come on, I know. Come on, are we taking care of what God's given to us? Everything I tell my kids, if you don't take care of the stuff you got, God ain't giving you better stuff. Because I'm an owner of nothing, and I'm a steward of everything. Everything I have belongs to God. You want to borrow my car, you're borrowing God's car. You better return it in better condition than you gave it to, I gave it to you. Are you here? Live your life that way. This is God's house. We keep the house good. People come in with their coffee and spill coffee all over. It happens. I spilled my coffee the other day, Bible, yesterday in Bible school. Thank God, Jaleesa helped me, you know, was, you know. But stuff happens, but don't just leave it. Tell somebody. Put some safe. That's why we're always cleaning the car. Why? This is the house of God. Yeah. Come on, let's, if it was your own house, what would you do? Right. Are you here? Right. Let, let's, let's take care of what God has. But there's a law. You got to pay for it. Before, excuse me, before you pay for it, pray for it. Stop and ask God. Give God a chance. And if God tells you not now, are you okay? Yeah. Elijah came. They wanted to give him because he healed Naaman. Yeah. A, a big offering, a, a, a harvest. And Elijah said, no. Elijah said, no. It's not time for that. And then guess what happened? Gehazi got greedy. Yeah. He went back and, oh, he changed, the prophet changed his mind. Can I have some wealth and riches? And guess what? He broke out. God judged him because it's not time. Trust God. I was in Bible school. I remember I was, tr- I was, I was up, upset. I went to Bible school, and it was a time of sowing, and I wanted to reap. And I'm like, I'm learning all these faith. I was in a word of faith school. Come on, we're learning to name it and claim it and all the faith scriptures and the Bible, and I'm taking all these tests and passing them. And I'm like, God, it's not working. <laughs> I'm worse off than I was before I... St- Gave up, went, you know, quit my job in uni and went to Bible school. I start grumbling, I start complaining, and I felt the presence of God lift off of me. And the fear of God hit me. I said, I'm so sorry. <laughs> God, please. Like David, don't take your presence from me. And I felt that pre- I felt, and I, I literally felt like a hand was removed from my life. And God showed me something. What's more important? And, and to me, that was the thing that I wanted. It's not the wealth of this world, but God had to test me to be faithful, to trust him in the hard times. And guess what? Then prosperity started flowing. Blessings started flowing. Ask God. Ask God for things. God wants us to to bless us, but there's a timing to it. Loving fathers bestow gifts on their kids. John 16 Verse 24, it says this, you've not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive so that your joy will be the fullest possible joy. Does God want us to ask? Yes, so that we can give. Does he want us to give? Yes, so that we can receive. 
Does he want us to receive? Yes, so what? Our joy can be full. I love Christmas. I've learned that it's better to give than to receive, but come on, I've been on the receiving end too. I love opening up under the tree. I love, you know, you're hoping for something. It's Christmas. And we get it. Are you here? God wants us to be full of joy. Joyful Christians have a positive testimony. And that's what somebody really wants, that people look at us and say, wow, your life, your marriage, your career, your, wow, there's something different. And you say, it's my daddy God. Jesus made the way for this. My father in heaven is a good, good father. Are you here? Pray. If we pray as much about our finances as we worry about them, we'll have less to worry about. If we pray about our finances as much as we worry about them, we'll have less to worry about them. Because in that place of prayer, God says, ask. I'm waiting for you to ask. Come on, let him be. The, 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 the one that, that we steward our finances as he gives us direction. Are you here? Amen. Number one, you have to ask. Number two, there's another if. Number two, if we want to see the blessing of God in our life, what do we have to do? God promised to meet our financial needs if you'll learn to be content. And that's the waiting part. You got to learn to be content. I talked about how I wanted everything now and I was grumbling, complaining. Be content with where you are. Well, why? I'm ready. God says, you're not ready. You think you're ready, but you're not ready. You're only 16. Come on. You're only 18. You're only 21. You're only 50. Come on, there's a process of maturity God's bringing in our life to manage what God has given to us. God took, had to train me and deal with my character and deal with me for, for, for 20 years before he would let me pastor City Harvest Church. Why? Because God's working in my life. Are you here? There's some things, that wrong thing I had to get out. There's some things about pastoring. Thank God God didn't let me pastor. God, I want to church now. I want to serve you. It would have been a train wreck. Thank God God worked in me for 20 years before he allowed me to pastor you. I could have still done it. I could have preached, but guess what? It would have probably not have been a good thing. Are you here? We've got to learn to be content. God's more interested in our character than in our comfort. Come on, let's say it together. Say, God's more interested in my character than in my comfort. Why? He wants us to grow up. He wants us to be mature. He wants us to be like Jesus. He's not interested in making our life easier. He's interested in our attitude during the hard times. Come on. Check your attitude during the hard times. Are you grumbling and complaining? Are you thankful for what you have? Come on, how many of you slept in a bed last night? What are you complaining about? There's a lot in the, the world's population that don't even have a bed to sleep in, don't even have a roof over their heads. Are you here? How many of you ate three meals yesterday? How many ate four or five? Outcomes. <laughs> Come on. We're blessed. We're blessed. How many of you had transportation to get to church this morning? You didn't have to walk half a day. What are you complaining about? Are you here? But I want more. Learn to be content. We're brought into a system here in America, in a materialistic system that says, having more will make you happy. Or if I just have all (laughs) enough wealth, I'll be happy. And what happens? We think more about things than we think about God. We think about more of the things we don't have than we think about God. We think more about building our house than building his house. Gwen shared a powerful scripture this morning. David was more concerned about God's house than his house. That's why God built his house. And the world, if we're materialistic, is God going to aid or support our addiction to materialism? If he's a good father? No, he's watching our attitude. Have we learned to be content? 
The Bible tells us in Timothy, I put it up for you, verse Timothy 6, verse 8. It says this, there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment. For we brought nothing into this world and will take nothing out of it. There's great gain in godliness. Well, I'm spiritual. I prophesy. I pray in tongues. But are you content? Because really, godliness is being content. Trusting God. Paul says, I can abase, I can abound, and whatever state I'm in, I'm content. I'm happy. No matter how much I got in the bank or how much I don't got in the bank, my happiness is not dependent on my bank balance. It's not dependent on the car I drive. You know, I got a nice car. It's not dependent on what I have or what I don't have. It's dependent on being a son, being a daughter of God. Are you here? A baby is born, and how many know they don't come into the world with a whole lot? All they got is is an umbilical cord, and guess what? That gets cut off real quick. How many know that when someone dies at a funeral, they don't take anything with them? There's no U-Haul behind the hearse. Everything's left. We come in with nothing and we leave with nothing. What's the most important thing? Are we content? If we're just living for things, we'll never be content. Don't sweat it. Don't make it the most important thing in your life. God knows what we have need of. What's the most important thing in life? It's not things. Learn to be content. Now, contentment is not not having any goals. Contentment is not not having ambition. Contentment is not not, not even not having financial goals. Financial goals are, are, are good. It's good to have goals and know where we're heading. Yeah. That's part of the asking and the seeking. Amen? The knocking. But contentment means happiness is not dependent on my circumstances. Contentment is not dependent on my circumstances. It's not dependent on the outward. It's dependent on me and my relationship with God and that I'm a son. Amen? Many people get caught into when and then thinking. When I have this, I'm going to be happy. Oh, if I just could be married and have one boy and one girl and this car and this house, I'm going to be happy. No, you're not. Come on. We got it all figured out. People have that and they're not happy. When I get to a certain level financially, I'm going to be happy. When I get a certain job, oh, I can retire. When, When I get the house paid off, oh, when this bill's paid off, then I'll be happy. And once you get there, what happens? There's something else you want. You always want more. And there's people, Orange County is filled with those kind of people. Moving house every six months and always do, because they're never satisfied. Howard Hughes, you know Howard Hughes, the great philanthropist. He was asked, how much does it take to make you happy? And he said this, just a little more. We've got to learn to be contentment. Again, it's not not having goals. Have goals. Have faith. But are you content while you're waiting for those goals? Are you content with what you have? Are you allowing God to order your steps? Are you being a steward? Come on, contentment cannot be on our circumstances in life. Paul learned contentment in Philippians 4 verse 12. The Bible says, I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I've learned the secret of contentment in every situation. What did he say? I learned. How did he learn? Through hard times. How did he learn? Through the times when you don't have what you want yet. Are you willing to be content? God, if nothing happens, God, I'm still going to love you and serve you. And God says, now you're ready. In ministry. It has to be that way. We were struggling at 50 people, not breaking. I'm thinking, 50 people? Man, my leaders meeting was 1,000 people. I'm in a church of 32,000 people and I'm here for 50 people? Oh, don't look at me like that. (laughs) It's your humanity. And God said to me, will you be happy with 50 people the rest of your life if that's what I want you to do? And I was like, no. (laughs) Come on. But I began to see that's not the right attitude. But when I'm like, I said, God, I don't care who shows up. 
whether we got 20 people or 20,000 people, as long as your presence is there and you pay the bills, I'm okay. Come on, give the Lord a shout, amen? Then what happens? We broke 50, we broke 100, we're breaking 150. We're we're moving forward. We're we're about reaching our community. Are you here? Be content. It's not natural to be content. It's not natural for me. And it's not natural for you. It's something we got to learn. Can you say amen? amen? How do you learn to be content? Stop doing the things that cause discontentment. What causes discontentment? Comparing. What causes discontentment? Looking at what other people have and what you don't have. You compare yourself. You compare houses. You compare clothes. You compare their car. Come on, you buy a new computer, and guess what? You looked at a magazine, and a newer one came out with an even faster chip, with an even better screen. And what do you think? I want that. You just got a computer. It works great. But you're discontent. God says it's stupid, it's foolish for us to compare, amen? Have you ever bought a new car and you see the new car, but guess what? A newer model comes out the next year. That has a newer feature on it. And now what do we do? We feel like I don't have that feature. I want that feature. I mean, we got the iPhone 14 is out, but I got only the 13. But there's a new feature. It has a little bit better camera. It has a little bit better video, and I want it. But how many videos and photos are you taking? Maybe you're taking too many selfies. God don't want you to, God don't want you to have that. Come on, your Instagram's always like, it's all you. Hi, I'm woke up this morning. Hi, I'm having lunch. Look at me, I'm at the gym. Look at me, look at me, look at me. And God says, you don't need that camera, amen. Be content with what you have. I'm just playing, but you get the point, amen. Life isn't worth living, we think, without a frill. All the advertisements, everything we see, Instagram popping up at us. I mean, all this stuff, you know, I'm trying to get in shape and you see, you start looking at health stuff and all the health stuff starts coming up. You know, all the, the, the fit pictures start coming up. They start looking. And for this, this thing, see, the secret is there's just this little pill you can take and click here. Give me your email. Give me your phone number. And now you start getting bombarded with all that crazy stuff and getting spammed. Where am I getting spammed from? Because you put your name in there. Come on. Come on. All that stuff don't work. Oh, some of you are very discouraged right now. Stop comparing. Don't allow yourself to be discontent. God says you can't handle what I want to give you because you're putting too much priority on it. Can God trust you with wealth? He can if you're not content with what you have. You gotta learn to be content. I don't know why, but God has chosen money to be the acid test of your faith. God has chosen money, and he said it's the magnifier of our heart. Where our treasure is, that's where our heart will be. We spend our entire lives trying to make it, trying to earn it, trying to save it, trying to spend it, trying to use it, and we think money, money, money. We even look at spirituality by how much money that we have, but God says no. Happiness isn't dependent on what you have. Are you here? If you don't learn contentment, you're never going to be happy. You're always going to be wanting more. God wants to bless us, but we've got to learn contentment. Number three, you learned something this morning? God wants to bless us if you'll practice giving in faith. This is what we call the Lord of the harvest. We've got to ask for his help. We've got to be contentment, content, excuse me, and we've got to practice giving in faith. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 9, the Bible says this, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each one should give what he's decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or out of compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I've said this before, Dwayne was shocked. I said, if you feel pressured to give, don't give. He said, I've never heard a pastor say that. 
but God said it. Are you here? God says don't give under pressure. God says only give if you're giving cheerfully. You don't get any credit for when you give under pressure, for when you give under guilt. Anything you do and it's not in faith, it doesn't count. If you're look, God says, I'm not looking at the amount, I'm looking at your attitude. Jesus said that people gave big offerings. Jesus wasn't moved. He was moved at the attitude of the woman with two mites. Oh my gosh, God's wanted to take everything I have. No, he's looking at your attitude. What's our attitude? Are we casual? We just, uh, $25, ah, $50, ah, $100, and it doesn't move us. Or $1,000 and it doesn't move us. It's not about the amount. It's about our heart. Yeah. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8 says, And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that in all things, at all times, you'd have all that you need, and you will abound in every good work. Notice the promise is here. But what is the premise? We want the promise. Amen. But what's the premise? Sowing and reaping. It's the principle of the law of the universe. It applies into every area of our heart. If I sow criticism, guess what I'm going to reap? Criticism. If I sow generosity, what am I going to get? It's going to come back to me. I'm going to reap generosity. If I sow energy, I'm going to reap energy. Some of you don't believe me. Guess what? You go to the gym. Oh, my God, I'm exhausted. I can't believe that. But guess what? You wake up the next morning. Woohoo! Because you sowed energy, guess what? You reap it. It comes back. Your body, the blood, starts reproducing. It's good. How many of you like to donate blood? I know Sophia is a gold donator, you know. But guess what? When you give your blood, what happens? It produces healthier blood. I haven't been given blood. How many? I can't believe I got any left. It's good for you. You produce more blood. It lowers your cholesterol. It causes healthy blood to come. Can you imagine a farmer? Oh my gosh, I got no harvest. I got 40 bags of seed. That's all I've got. They sow the 40 bags of seed at home, crying. I'd say it's over. I got nothing left. No, I sowed the 40 bags of seed. But does the farmer reap 40 bags of seed back? He reaps much more than that. It's the law of multiplication. Are you here? Yes. We, he gets far more and he gets a harvest that he can enjoy and even more seed. Yeah. And that's what God says he wants to do for us. It's the law of sowing and reaping. Yeah. Well, bless God, I don't have to give. I don't have to sow. I can just give my time. That's why you got more than you, enough time on your hand. All you got is time. But no money. I heard Christians say that. You don't have to give. You don't have to. God understands. You just give them your time. That's why you got so much time and you're unemployed. You got so much time and no money. Are you here? Whatever you sow, you'll reap. If you need a harvest of finances, what do you have to sow? I mean, come on. That's, that's, it's not rocket science, but yet we struggle with it. Because really what's the issue? It's the heart. God is a giver. God so loved the world that he gave. Was it hard to give his son? But why did he give? Because he saw all of you and the billions of people around the world and all the sons and daughters. He sowed one son and he reaped billions. Why did Jesus go to the cross? He says, because of the joy that's set before me. The sins can be broken and the family of God can be restored. And I'm going to have thousands and billions of brothers and sisters that can be restored to the family of God. Are you here? When God set up the universe, he said this, I'm going to reward my children when they're like me. Every time we're generous and we give, guess what? We're like God. God says, give, it will be given to you. Luke 6, verse 38, give and it will be given to you. And the measure you use to give out will be the measure which God uses to give back to you. What does he say? The measure that you give, if you give sparingly, guess what? That's all you have is sparing. But if you give abundantly, 
you'll experience abundance in your life. Amen? God says, let's play a game. Children, let's see who can give the most. Let's see who can be the most generous. Because God wants to build character in us. He wants us to learn to be a giver. What's the point? When I hoard my money, all I have is my money. But I have no security. But when I give it away, God multiplies it. And I learn that money is just a river. If I keep giving, it keeps flowing. I learn that money comes easily, frequently, and abundantly. Because I'm generous and I give out. And what money is coming in. And when I get, I'm given. You know what I've done? I know money's coming in. I'm writing and giving before I even got the check. I'm so excited to give. Sowing. Blessing. Sowing. We were at a pastor's conference this week. We sow into the network. Why? They're helping pastors. Pastors are closing down. Churches are closing down every month. Pastors are quitting all the time because they're too tired. Come on, we need a war chest to help pastors and help churches. Come on. I want to be a part of that. Susan showed me an article that was in, you know, of a Singaporean couple that's an architect. They went to Ukraine and they almost stepped on a mine and almost died. So you know what they did? We're going to build bomb-proof houses in Ukraine for free. And they've taken resources, they've raised money, and they're building houses for families that, that are safe, that they can live. Come on, that's how we need to think. That's how God thinks. Oh, God, please bless Ukraine. And he's trying to talk to you and get money to you so he can bring money through you. Are you here? And 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8, what did God say? God says, God is able. Someone says he's able. To make all grace, say all grace, abound to you that in all things, say all things, at all times, say all times, having all that you need, say all I need. You will abound in every or all works. Look at all the alls in there. God will supply all our needs. God will supply everything that we need. This verse is true. But what do we do? There's a promise, but there's a premise. All includes everything. It doesn't leave us anything to worry about. Why are we worrying? Because we're more worried about what we don't have in our our needs than we are about being a giver. Do we go to bed at night thinking, oh, I need this, I need this, I'm anxious about what I have? Or do we go to bed, God, did I steward what you gave me this month? Did I give everything you wanted me to give? Did I do everything you wanted me to do? You see the difference? Amen? Proverbs 3 verse 9 says this, honor the Lord by giving him the first part of your income. Someone say the first part. And what he will fill your barns to overflow. We got to put first things first. If I get $1,000, I give 100 to God. If I get $10,000, I give 1000 to God. Yeah. If I get a million dollars, I give 100000 to God. Yeah. My heart has no issue. I'm not attached to money. Yeah. Well, that's a lot of money. No, it's not. It's just a number. Yeah. Are you here? I, I, I can't, when I wrote my first $1,000 check, oh, it broke something in me. But it was easier to write a $10,000 check. Yeah. Come on, I haven't written a $100,000 check, but I'm believing one day, Amen. Yeah. Come on, come on, you should say me too. Come on. It's just a number. But if God can trust me to write a $1,000 check, he can trust me to write a $5,000 check. He knows he can trust me with a $10,000 check. If he can't trust me with a $10,000 check, you think he's going to give me a million dollars to write a $100,000 check? Are you here? I put this up. Tithing is not charity. Tithing is an act of worship. If I don't give it, I don't give it to anyone else. I give it to God. I don't give it to Citibank. I don't give it to San Diego Gas and Electric. I don't give it to, I don't even know who our mortgage is with, but whoever it is. I give it to God. Because that's my worship. Amen? It's an act of worship that says all of it came from you in the first place. And if it weren't for you, I wouldn't have anything. God says, put me first in your life and watch what I will do. I will bless you. Your barns will be full. And he uses money to test our heart more than anything else. 
We pay our tithes. And then with a 90%, we're happy to steward it in the way God wants. But let me tell you, God's not taking the whole 90%. He doesn't want 100% for us. He wants us to enjoy the harvest. And there's more than enough. So say more than enough. To do what he's called us to do. That's the God we serve. Amen? I don't give my kids an allowance and then make them give it all back to me. Are you here? But I tell my kids, honor God. When Susan and I first got married, we determined no matter what we, state we're in, we're going to always tithe. We're going to always put God first. We're going to always obey God in whatever it is he tells us to do and live by faith and God has prospered us. Amen? Amen. The Bible says where our treasure is, our heart is. Sometimes we think we can't afford to tithe. But what's the issue? We're looking at the wrong thing. And as your pastor, let me tell you, you can't afford not to tithe. Can't afford not to tithe. Amen? Amen. Number four, you learning something? God wants to prosper us, but we must do these things. We have to ask for his help. We've got to learn contentment. We've got to begin to practice giving in faith and the laws of seed time and harvest. And he promises us that he'll prosper us if we maintain our integrity. We've got to assume responsibility for our financial needs and know that God is with us. But God doesn't bless dishonesty. Some of us are dishonest. We, we say we're giving 10%, but it's 1%. Don't be dishonest with God. Amen. Proverbs 16, 11 says, The Lord demands fairness in every business deal, in our wages, in how we do our wages, and in our sales, in our taxes. God can't bless our finances. We've got to be honest. You can't rip people off. You can't take a deduction if there never was one. Well, I'm going to save $10,000 and get out of the favor of God and break the premise to have the promise. You can't afford to do that. There was an Indonesian businessman and multimillionaire many times over in my previous church. And when he first came to God, you know, they have two books. They have the public books and the private books. So it's the books that we do to file, to save, and under declare, and over claim. And then the real books. And God convicted him. He said, but God, that's a lot of taxes. Taxes are ridiculous in my country. And God said, can you trust me? And he put away and had one set of books which was the accurate books, and what happened? That year, his business almost doubled. The next year, it almost doubled because God was saying, look, if you walk in integrity, come on, you'll have more than enough. You render to Caesar what's due to Caesar and render to God what's due to God, and you'll have more than enough. (laughs) Proverbs 19 verse 1 says, better to be poor and honest than rich and dishonest. Proverbs 10 verse 22 says, the blessing of the Lord brings wealth and he adds no trouble to it. If you profit dishonestly, it's gonna bring trouble. It's gonna bring trouble. If you're dishonest with others, well, they don't know, everything seems fine, it's gonna come back. What you sow is what you reap. Well, I haven't got caught yet. Well, the clock is ticking. What goes around comes around, amen? Whatever you sow, you're gonna reap. So be honest, be integrous with your finances. And everybody said amen. Can you take one more? I'd like the musicians to come. What's the premise? God will prosper us if we ask. God will prosper us if we're content. God will prosper us if we apply the laws of giving and faith, seed time and harvest. If we have integrity, and number five, if we trust him as a son and as a daughter. We start with that and it all ends with that. Matthew 6, verse 33 says, your heavenly father, not God who's out there somewhere, but your father, he already knows perfectly well what you need and he wants to give it to you. If you give him first place in your life and you live as he wants you to. You know, when I was a kid, I had a dad. And I'd go to my dad, and I don't know how much things cost. I never thought about how something cost. I went to my dad and said, Dad, I need some shoes. Dad, I need a baseball glove. Dad, I need a computer for school. 
Dad, I need this. Dad, I need that. And I never once thought, did he have money? Because he's my daddy. That's what daddies do. They provide for their kids. And maybe we didn't have a father like that. I had a father who was a provider. And even times it was difficult. He always made sure that we had what we needed. Not once in my lifetime did I ever worry where he was going to find the money. Why? That's his job. He's the father. I'm the kid. Kids spend. Fathers make money. Come on. And you can, moms make money too. But there's provision that's there. It's a deal we have. We need something. Our father's going to make it happen for us. Our father's going to help us. I needed a car. He helped me in my first car. There were times in my life, my father helped me. He never told me no. He was always there to do if he could do it. Are you here? But sometimes we didn't have a father like that, maybe. Maybe we didn't grow up in, in a healthy environment. And so what happened? We act like a spiritual orphan. But we forget we got a heavenly father. It says our Heavenly Father already knows what we need, but He's waiting for us to ask. And He says He will provide. Does God take care of the birds? They don't worry about bird seed. They don't worry about having grain. Nothing in creation worries except for human beings. Birds don't worry. Plants don't worry, even though we're in a drought. Are you here? The only thing that worries is human beings. We worried about finance. We worry what we don't have. But what's the real issue? Do we trust our creator? Do we trust our Abba, Father, our heavenly God? If God can take care of the birds, Jesus said, how much more do you think he's not going to take care of you? What are we worried about? What's the bottom line here? How much do we trust God? It all starts with this and it ends with, are we a son? of our Father's house? Are we building legacy for our Father? You know, people, they have legacy and they, they build legacy for the family name. Come on, we're, we're named by Jesus. We're named by the Father. Are we building legacy for our Father? Or are we caught up in worry? What is worry? I put this up. Worry, worry is really a form of atheism. What's atheism? God doesn't really exist. Every time we worry, we're acting like an atheist. It's not up to God, it's up to me. I'm an orphan, I gotta make it happen. It all depends on me. It's all up to me. That's not in the Bible. God says it's not up to us, it's up to Him. It doesn't depend on me, it depends on Him. Our Heavenly Father has a big hand in all of this and prospering his servants. But worry is the warning light that we're doubting the love of God in our lives. It's a warning light that what? That, that we doubt that God is gonna perform his word in our life. We trust God and we say, I give you my life, I give you my eternity, but we can't trust him with our finances. We can't trust him with our time. We can't trust him. That he's not gonna abuse us for our talent. And we find it hard to give him first place. If we allow anything except God to have first place in our life, what happened? It becomes a source of anxiety. And we eventually can lose it. First Timothy 6, verse 17, the Bible says this, don't put your hope in wealth, which has, is so uncertain, but put your hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Why? He's a good father. Psalms 11 verse 5 says, He gives food to those who trust Him and He never forgets His promises. What do we got to do? Come on, friends. We got to ask for it. We got to learn to be content with what we have. Get out of grumbling and complaining. Come on. Apply the laws of seed time and harvest. They work. Walk in integrity and know that we are a son, we're a daughter, that God wants us to bless. And when we have that mindset, come on. God will withhold no good thing from us. As we have that maturity, God can trust us. He'll bring money to us because he knows he can bring money through us. Come on, if you believe that, give the Lord a shout. Amen. Come on, let's stand on our feet this morning. Come on, begin to tell God, God, I put my trust in you. If you've been at doing things and spending without asking, ask God for forgiveness. Say, God, I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask before I pay. 
Come on, you've been grumbling because you don't have enough and, and God's not good enough and you've been coming against his character. Come, repent, say, God, forgive me. Help me to be content. If you've not been applying the laws of seed time and harvest, come on. Sow into good ground. 